1 Samuel 23, verses 14 through 18. And David stayed in strongholds in the wilderness, remained in the mountains in the wilderness of Ziph. Saul sought him every day, but God did not deliver him into his hand. So David saw that Saul had come out to seek his life, and David was in the wilderness of Ziph in a forest. Then Jonathan, Saul's son, arose and went to David in the woods and strengthened his hand in God. And he said to him, Do not fear, for the hand of Saul my father shall not find you. You shall be king over Israel, and I shall be next to you. Even my father Saul knows that. So the two of them made a covenant before the Lord, and David stayed in the woods, and Jonathan went into his own house. Have you ever been discouraged? Yes. Yeah, man, it just happens, doesn't it? Sometimes you turn around and, and, and things are going really well, but hit after hit after hit comes, and you turn around and you're like, man, I don't know what happened, but I'm super discouraged right now. It happens to the best of us. Nobody sets out their week and says, you and I are going to try to make this the most discouraging week I've ever had, but you turn around and you just become discouraged. My wife and I say, nobody likes me, everybody hates me, I'm going to eat some worms. And if you feel like that, how much more do you think other people feel that way? If you feel that way, how much more do you think other people feel that way? I will tell you that I am probably one of the most headstrong people that you ever meet in your life. I will fight, I will win, I will not quit. But there are extended periods of my life where I've been extremely discouraged. Extremely. Like I don't, I don't live in this fantasy world where I never get discouraged. I often get discouraged. If I feel that way, I expect that probably many of you feel that way as well. God wants you to be an encourager. He really does. And this is what we see in this, ser in this sermon and in this scripture. What we see is David has gone away from the woods because he's discouraged because of Saul chasing him. Jonathan comes to the woods and encourages his friend David so that David would be able to fulfill the purpose that God has for him in his life. I want to tell you this morning, the, the point of this sermon is very simple. God wants you to be an encourager. Yeah. Yeah. God wants to use you as the means to encourage other people. You are a vessel of Almighty God to be the mouthpiece for Him to encourage people that are discouraged. And if you're not being an encouraging person, you're not doing your job. The first point we're going to talk about this morning is that encouragement requires caring. I shall be next to you. In verse 14 and 15 it says, And David stayed in strongholds in the wilderness, remained in the mountains in the wilderness of Ziph. Saul sought him every day, but God did not deliver him into his hand. So David saw that Saul had come out to seek his life. And David was, was in the wilderness of Ziph in a forest. See, the beginning of the encouraging uh, part of this story with Jonathan is, and David is that Jonathan actually had to come to the realization that David was missing and that he was no longer in his uh, direct uh, area of operation. And so he had to care enough to notice that David was missing and want to help him. He actually had to care about his friend. He had to not be self-centered or to be selfish. The Bible says in Proverbs 18, 14, the spirit of a man will sustain him in sickness, but who can bear a broken spirit? What does that scripture mean? It means that if you get sick or if your elbow hurts or whatever's going wrong in your life, you can sustain yourself through your sickness. You've got the means and the will to be able to do that. But if you have a broken spirit, it's very hard to overcome that. What Jonathan noticed is he said, you know what? I bet you my friend is discouraged. I care about him. I'm going to go to him and encourage him because I'm guessing that he's got a broken spirit at this moment. Can you imagine how hard it must have been for David to be in a situation where the king was trying to kill him on a daily basis? That was David's life. The king of Israel is pursuing David, trying to kill him at every single chance that he gets. I would guess that David was probably discouraged. It's literally as if the president of the United States was pursuing you right now, trying to kill you. With, with all of the power, with all of the armament, with all the military, and said, you know what? I want you to do everything that you can to destroy this person. Every time you went out of the house, there's a drone. Tapping your phones, tapping your... Well, they're doing that already. But, I mean, they're, if, <laughs> Alexa would really be watching you. It's kind of like, have you ever had a, a job where you felt like you were going to get fired every day? 
Have you guys ever had those types of jobs or the worst types of jobs? I've had those jobs. <laughs> Sunday night, you get that pit in your stomach because you know you have to go Monday and fight, and you can't do anything right, get written up. You never had those jobs? It's the worst, man. No one likes that type of job. And, and you think how discouraged you were in that paltry situation with the assistant second fry cook and you couldn't even handle that, right? And then here's David being pursued by death by the king. I'm guessing that he was discouraged. He didn't think he was going to make it. But here's what happens is that Jonathan couldn't be a friend and an encouragement to David if he was consumed with his own issues and problems. Jonathan didn't go out to the woods and be like, bro, did you hear about what's happening with me and my dad, man? My dad is so upset with me because I'm helping you as a friend. And I wanted to come all the way out here in the woods and tell you about my problems. Yeah. You guys ever had that experience where you're kind of going through something and you're at your wits end and you want to call someone. You're like, hey, I just wanted to call you and tell you what's going on with me and my family. And then they take over the conversation. Great. I'm glad you called. Let me tell you about what's going on with me. And then they talk for an hour and you're like, it's kind of, you, some people, you can literally set down the phone and they're just, wah, 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 wah. <laughs> Crystal catch me, so I'll just hold the phone out. They're not listening. I called you because I needed encouragement and now you've taken over the conversation and made it about you. If you do that, stop. <laughs> Pay very close attention to people that are calling you for an encouragement and don't take over the conversation. The Bible says in Proverbs 27, 9, ointment and perfume delight the heart and the sweetness of a man's friend gives delight by hearty counsel. I'm guessing this is what Jonathan was doing is that he was being a sweet friend. He's giving him first hearty counsel. David is in despair and then Jonathan becomes in despair because his friend is missing and he went to seek him out. Why? Because he cared about him. Why else would he go out there unless he cares about his friend? What does it mean to you? What is your life about? Is your life about yourself or is your life about others? Because as a Christian, your life is supposed to be about other people. And I, and I understand that, that it's countercultural in this day and age to say that because everybody that advertises to you, every movie, every television, every song, makes you think that this world revolves around you, but that's not Christianity. That's not Christianity. That's not a follower of Christ does not live their life for themselves. They live their life for other people. The Bible says in Philippians 2, 4, let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Some of you are so self-centered, all you heard was, I need to look out for my own interests. Yeah. And I get it, man. Like, you, if you're on a plane that's going down, you've got to uh, fix your oxygen mask first before fixing your children. You've got to be breathing. I get that. But some people are sucking their own oxygen mask, watching other people die like, it sucks to be you. Because yeah. yeah. they're so self-centered, man. Their whole life, every moment, every dollar, every, every bit of a, uh, encouragement they have for themselves, they have nothing or a will to give it to anybody else. Do you think about the needs of others? Do you think to yourself, man, who can I encourage? Who can I lift up? Who can I love? Who around me is discouraged that I can be an encouragement to? What one of your coworkers, your neighbors, people at church, people that you meet when you go out to the store? The world is filled with discouraged people. Yeah. Most people don't wake up just like, man, I am awesome. Yeah. If, if you do, there's probably, there's probably something wrong there, okay? <laughs> Most people are just like, here we go. Not, not you guys. Thank you. Marcus Cola, thank you. The rest of y'all are like, this is for Matt and Marcus. I'll preach to you, bro. Okay, this just be you and me today. Because I need this word. Amen? Philippians 2, 3, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. Is every conversation about you? Is every story about how awesome you are? And then guys are the worst at this. Like guys always do the one-upsmanship, right? It's, it's never like guys are like, hey man, I went down and I did three of whatever it is. Guys are like, that's nothing, man. I did 17. And then another guy comes up and is like, man, I had one arm, my eye was covered, and I did 44. Like guys will do whatever it is to one-up somebody else. 
That's not what your life is supposed to be about, man. It's about encouraging other people, lifting up other people, loving other people. The Bible says that we esteem others better than ourselves. And I get it, man. This is very hard in a self-centered society to think about how you're going to build up other people. The Bible says in Galatians 16, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. This needs to be front and center in the Christian church. The Bible makes it very clear that as Christians, we are to encourage each other in the household of faith. If you were really living your life demonstratively for Jesus out there every single week, you would need the encouragement of your brethren because you would be living in such a way that the world would not like the way that you're living because the way that you're living for Jesus. And so when you come into the household of faith, we have an obligation to bear with each other's burdens. You've got to have a mind shift. And if you haven't had this mind shift, today's your day. You are not merely an attender of a church. Okay, you, you don't come in and, oh, that music was really good. And, oh, man, that guy, he preached a really good word. And it was for me. And then I'm going to go out and live my life unto myself. That's not this, the point of this exercise, folks. We gather together as the people of God to worship a holy God as the bride of Christ. God speaks through the preaching of the word to edify the body. Yes. This, whole, the, this whole exercise isn't about edifying you. It's to edify the body so an unbelieving world can look at God's holy church and say, man, those people love one another in a world that can't love each other and say there must be a God of the universe. I want to know him. I want to love him. I want to lift him up. Yes. Charity starts at home. Yes. We've got to be encouraging one another. It, it, it's, it's, the Bible says this in Ephesians uh, 2.19. Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and the members of the household of God. This is why I don't believe in individual Christianity. How do you live out that verse if you stay at home? You can't. How can, you, how can you live out the scriptures unless you're in a household of faith where you're, where you're b- building each other up? And people say, well, I don't need all that. Well, if you are so full, come and encourage the rest of us because we need it. Come in and just toss it out like free donuts. You know what I mean? Come on, man, I'm so full. I just came in today to encourage you. Me, me especially because I need it. God has created us for relationship. And if we're going to be the church that God wants us to be, we have to care about each other. And this isn't just the job of the pastors and the deacons. It's not. As as the church continues to grow, and and I've got my phone here, and I've got probably 150 guys that sent my phone, and I send them texts, and I make them phone calls. And I'm sure if you're a man here and you've ever gotten a text or a phone call from me, you're like, man, it probably felt pretty good, didn't it? I can't do it for everybody every day. It takes us all. It's not just the job of the deacons. It's not just the job, like, it's not the job for people that have titles. It's the job of the person that holds the title Christian. To encourage people, to build each other. Some of you, as I'm preaching this sermon, are like, I have never encouraged anybody else. You have to have at least two or three people that you think about. Hopefully, I mean, if, if, and I understand it's part of what I do as a pastor, but I literally spend most of my time consumed thinking about other people, where they at and what are they doing. You can at least fill somewhere in your brain where you have two or three people that you care about that you're trying to encourage. Do you come to church looking for someone else to encourage, to love on someone else? During the week, are you reaching out to somebody? Who's your two, man? Who's your three? Who's your four? Who's your five? Do you text them? Do you call them? Do you message them? Do you take them out to lunch? Who are you reaching out to? See, because encouragement requires investment. I shall be next to you. See, first Jonathan had to actually be paying attention to see that there was a need. But then Jonathan had to go to his friend and seek him out. Verse 16, then Jonathan, Saul's son, arose and went to David in the woods and strengthened his hand. You have got to be inconvenienced and invested if you're going to be an encourager. Picture David. He's running from Saul, running from his life. He's out there in the woods. He's not on his cell phone. He's not got a little campfire, you know, cooking some, you know, mac and cheese or something. He's probably out there in the middle of nowhere tossing rocks at the side of a, a, side of a, a tree thinking, everybody has forgot about me. Nobody loves me. I'm going to die. And here comes Jonathan over the hill. If I'm David, I'm like, what? It's my boy. Woo! 
Jonathan probably did. Everything David needed to hear was spoken when he saw Jonathan coming over the hill. He was like, that's my boy. I knew I wasn't going to be out here alone. I knew I wasn't going to die. Here comes my boy. How easy it would have been for Jonathan to just claim that, you know, David, I, I would have came, bro. I was just busy, man. I've been busy with this thing. And, uh, you know, my dad, he's been, dad's been all over me, you know. I know I said I'd be there for you, and we made those agreements and stuff, but I just, man, with my dad and stuff, I just don't think I could make it, man. Uh, I'll, 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 I'll catch you on the other side, though. No. Getting involved is costly. Jonathan had to defy his father, the king, to go to his friend out in the woods, invest his time, his energy, to go to where his hurting friend was and pour out of himself. Proverbs 3.27, do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it is, your, when it is in the power of your hand to do so. And, and Jonathan's purpose is very simple, and we see it in the scripture. It says to strengthen his hand in God. David's hand had become feeble. He probably was questioning his calling. He was questioning whether or not he was going to be able to do what he needed to do. And Jonathan's stated purpose was, I'm going to go strengthen him in the hand of God. I'm going to make sure that my boy is encouraged. He knew David was going to be king, so he wanted to make sure that he wouldn't give up. The Bible says in Proverbs 25, 11, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in, setting of, in settings of silver. Uh, uh, Someone was nice enough to say to me in between service because I didn't understand it. Gold is more valuable than silver, but silver is harder than gold. So when you put silver around gold, it protects the investment. That's yeah, real good, isn't it? A third service, I'll say I came up with it on my own. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but when, you, when, when someone's got that type of investment in you, like it, it's valuable, is it not? How wonderful it must have been for David to look up out in the wilderness and see his friend out of nowhere showing up to encourage him you know I talk about Pastor Jay a lot because Jay's my, Jay's my boy man he is and people are always like man you know Pastor Matt and Jay they're like thick as thieves the two of them you can't get in between them and you can't woo woo you can't you know what I'm saying like this guy he's been down since day one high school I'm like I'm gonna be a rapper Jay's like I'll be your dancer you know what I mean like I hear it like he'll, he's been down. You know what I'm saying? This is so true. Like, this is what we do. This is what we doing. Jay's like, I'm in. We're doing it. You know, I was in the army and I was in basic training. And, uh, you know, basic training is long, tired, and all that other stuff. And at the end of basic training, we're in formation like a day before graduation. And, and Jay showed up. To my basic training graduation, he was living in Georgia, and, and he drove 750 miles to Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, just to, just to be, no one else from my family, my friends, nobody showed up to my basic training graduation except for Jay. And I, and I, I didn't clap, that's fine. Don't clap unless you're willing to do that yourself, though. Because it ain't a story about what Jay did, it's about what you don't do. You, you notice how the encouraging sermon really turned into what you're not doing? I mean, some people can't even pick up the phone and send a text. Oh, it's just so busy. Had a lot going on. This is a good sermon, man. This is really good. Look at Job chapter 2. Second service. Y'all always fired up. Now, if you don't know anything about Job, he had a really horrible life. And it says in uh, verse 11 of Job chapter 2, it says, Now when Job's three friends heard of all this adversity that had come upon him, each one came from his own place, all those guys' names, for they had a maid, an appointment together to come and mourn with him and to comfort him. Do you know how much, do you know how much your, your presence becomes a ministry? Like it's not even what you say. It's not even what you do. Like you just show up and all of a sudden somebody's encouraged. You just got to show up, man. You don't have to, well, I didn't know what I was going to say. Show up and say, I didn't know what to say. I just wanted to be here. And I guarantee you that the people around you will still be encouraged. Amen? Are you investing in others in a costly way? Who are you going into the woods to look for? Who, 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 who 
has a story in their life where you came up over the hill and they're like, really? You drove all the way here for that? Like you showed up at my work? You, you can't, really? Why for me? Because when you, when you do that to other people, like it's a huge encouragement to them. See, <laughs> What Jonathan knew is that David was going to be king and he wanted to make sure that David wouldn't give up. And, and again, man, I don't want to turn this into a Pastor Jay sermon, but like, dude, I can't even describe to you how many times I've wanted to quit this thing, even before it started. Jay was my Jonathan. Proverbs 25, 11 says, A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and settings of silver. It's so huge when you hear those words. God wants you to be an encourager, man. He really, really does. With everything inside of you, you need to be an encourager. God wants you to love on people and encourage them. You know, in, in Matthew 25, verse 40, there's a verse that many people take out of context. And, and the verse says, And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, Inasmuch as you did to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it for me. And a lot of times people use that scripture to talk about homeless people or, or, or sick people or whatever. That's not what this verse is about. The context of this verse is that Jesus was talking to people and saying, when you go and you love on one of my disciples who are my brethren, the people that aren't the disciples of Christ are not Christ's brethren. They're the wicked. Yeah. It doesn't say whatever you did to the least of these wicked people. He said, whatever you did for the least of these, my brethren, those that are in Christ, those that love Christ, his disciples, it's as if you're doing it to Christ himself. Yeah. And which isn't to say, the Bible says in, in, in a lot of places that we need to love people and encourage people and, and serve the poor and the needy. All of those things are true. That's just not what this scripture says. This scripture talks specifically about our job as Christians to encourage one another, to lift up those that are in the household of faith, to build those up. This is why the Bible says in Hebrews 10, 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as in the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. As a church, we need to gather and encourage one another. It's hard to be a Christian in this day and age. The, the world does not like us. They don't like what we say or how we live or what we believe. And so I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel like giving up. Sometimes I feel like I'm, I'm done fighting every fight. I'm done boycotting everything. I said to somebody before church, I can't buy everything I need at Hobby Lobby and Chick-fil-A. I just can't do it. <laughs> The, the world is so unbelievably against us. Yes. And so when we come together, it's an encourage, brother, sister, I know you're fighting the good fight of faith. I want to encourage you in Jesus' name. Life is hard enough without having to put on being a Christian. Yeah. It's hard enough to pay your bills and take care of your house and manage a household. Like that's hard. You put being a good Christian on top of that, it's hard. And don't say I don't need it because someone else needs you to be an encouragement. Amen. If you're so full, show up and encourage somebody else. Amen. And you say, well, pastor, how do I do that? Well, encouragement requires edification. I shall be next to you. It starts with your words. Jonathan spoke the words that David needed to hear. Verse 17, and he said to him, do not fear. For the hand of Saul, my father, shall not find you. You shall be king over Israel, and I shall be next to you. Psh, even my dad knows that. Yeah. His commitment to David was so strong that even his dad knew that his heart was turned towards David and not towards his dad. That's how deep his commitment was. See, Jonathan reminded him of what David knew but may have forgotten. David, God is going to do great things in your life. Things may not be good now, but they will be good. You've got to believe. I'm going to stand next to you and it will happen. Yeah. Proverbs 12, 25, anxiety in the heart of man causes depression, but a good word makes it glad. 
I mean, you all know this. You know that when, you, when, when, when you've got anxiety in your heart, it causes you to be depressed. But when someone comes around and sells you a word in good season, you're like, man, that feel, feels kind of good. I like it. I'm sure David was anxious. I'm sure he was distraught. I mean, come on now. He went from cave to stronghold. He's been running from Saul. I mean, this, <laughs> this story just seems to kind of keep repeating itself. Running, fighting, scared, like all these things that just continue to happen. I love Proverbs 16, 24. Pleasant words are like a honeycomb, sweetness to the soul and health to the bones. See, when Jonathan spoke to him, it encouraged him deeply, I believe. Yeah. Why? Because words are powerful. Yeah. Do, do you... Do you not go to sporting events where people yell and scream? Yeah. Come on, hit the ball! Yeah. Run faster! Like, that's what people do. Because you know that words encourage people. If you've ever played sports and someone's screaming for you, it makes you like, you try harder when people scream for you. You so much believe that words matter that you yell at the television screen during sporting events. <laughs> Run the ball! Don't pass it! Because you think they're going to hear you. But they don't hear you. But you believe it. When people come to you and they're discouraged, you we give them words because words matter. See, what happens though is that people are so down on themselves, they can't find a way to encourage anybody else. Dude, I just want to encourage you that this morning to tell you this, man. And, and this, is, um, <laughs> this is a thing. This is a trick. I'm going to tell you a trick. You ready? When you're really discouraged, go encourage other people and it will encourage you. When you're just in the pit, just start dialing the phone. Start dialing for dollars. Just like, hey, man, I just want to call and encourage you. I just want to call and love you. Hey, I want to tell you about why you're so awesome. And then you just turn around and you're just like, man, I feel really good about myself. Nobody's done anything for me, but I've encouraged other people, and now I'm encouraged myself. What does it mean to you? Are you, you specifically, verbally encouraging with your words, with your, sp and like, with your spouse, with your kids, with your friends, with strangers? The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5.11, Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. Folks, this is a requirement of Scripture that we're supposed to be encouraging. This isn't like, a, hey, when you feel like it, when you're full, when you find time to do it. No, this is like if you're going through the list of what Christians need to be doing, it needs to be encouraging. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Christians should be the most encouraging person in the room. Not the funniest person. Not the most intellectual person, not, not, the, not the most engaging person. No, they need to be the most encouraging person in the room. Both inside and outside the church, find ways to encourage people. Find it and praise it. You never know the life that you can change when you start thinking about other people. Because like, And again, if you're discouraged, think how much more discouraged other people are. And so when you go around and you start thinking about other people, you notice that it'll change their life. But you can't be that person if you're a person that destroys people all the time and destroys other people all the time with your words. It doesn't work that way. How do you do that? You send people a message. You take them out to lunch. You care that someone has gone missing from church. If you say, well, there's three services. How do I know? You can still message them and say, I haven't seen you at church lately. And they go, I go to second. I go to first. I go to third. Whatever. But I, at least I was thinking about you. I mean, when, when someone reaches out to you and says, I was thinking about you, I don't know anybody's like, man, who's that guy I think he is? Reaching out to me, telling he was thinking about me. Who's in church because of you? Who's at the feet of the cross because of you? The Bible says in Ephesians 4.29, Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. The, the words that we speak as Christians is so vitally important. We need to be encouragers. You cannot be an encourager if you're a gossiper. Gossip tears people down. If you don't know what gossip is, it's tearing somebody else down who's not in the room to turn somebody's heart against somebody because you can't figure it out in your own head. It's harsh words. And I don't know why. Guys are the worst at this, man. 
Like guys are so afraid. They're just like, someone might, I don't know. Like they, they're afraid to just come up and like give another guy a compliment. Like you get around guys and like, what's up, stupid? <laughs> it's what they do. Yeah. It's just disgusting. Yeah. And, and they think for some reason, they think it's funny. Yeah. They think it's, oh man, nice pants. Really? Thank you. Thank you. You know, I, 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 I don't know about you, but like I get dressed in the morning and I try to like not be picked on. Like that's the most what I try to do. And then I kind of look and I just like, the last thing you do is you kind of look in the mirror and you're just like, well, that's all I got. And you just kind of like <laughs> go out. And then you show up somewhere and some guy's like, nice shoes. I just put on some shoes, man. They were comfortable. You know, it's like I'm, I'm wearing these goggles today. I absolutely hate these things. I, I, I don't like, I've got something in my eye. And so I can't wear my contacts. People say, how long have you been wearing glasses? I haven't been wearing them for 20 years because I hate them. And people say, well, what's the big deal? I'll tell you the big deal, man. Like literally like seven years ago, one Sunday, I wore my glasses on a Sunday. And the first thing someone said to me was like, man, those glasses make your head look so huge. <laughs> I didn't laugh. I'm glad you guys think it's funny. I didn't laugh. I, I, th I thought about it this morning, seven years later, when I put on the glasses. Because of a word that some guy at this church said to me as their pastor. Thanks. Thank you. Let's go back to my notes. <laughs> it erodes at the foundations of a relationship, man. When you talk down to somebody and think you're being funny or sarcastic, that person doesn't walk away and go, well, they were probably being funny or sarcastic. Those words dig into your head and then you think about them for the rest of your life and it just couples on top of all the nasty stuff that people said to you when you were in elementary school. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. What good is it, man? Who wants to, like, just it'd be better for you to just be like, huh? like, just don't say anything. Lastly, encouragement takes commitment. I shall be next to you. See, Jonathan was committed to David through it. Jonathan was committed and he wasn't going to back out. It says in verse 18, So the two of them made a covenant before the Lord, and David stayed in the woods, and Jonathan went to his own house. Now the Bible doesn't make it very clear what covenant that they made. Pastor Jay's going to be preaching on covenant later this month. It doesn't, it, it doesn't make it clear what, uh, what Jonathan said to David, the covenant that they made. But, but if you don't understand the language of covenant, language of covenant is very easy. Covenants cannot be broken. Commitments can be broken, but covenants cannot be broken. It says, Jonathan says to David, you know what? I am committed to you, bro. Like I'm staying with you through everything and in anything. Deuteronomy 23, 23. That which is gone from your lips, you shall keep and perform. For you voluntarily vowed to the Lord your God, what you have promised with your mouth. See, Jonathan makes a commitment to David. He doesn't just change what he's doing. He goes out into the woods, strengthen his hand in God. And while he's there giving him words, he says, you know, as long as I'm here, why don't we make a covenant with one another? Because I want you to make sure that you can count on me. I'm committed to you through it all. When everybody else runs, I'm running with you. No, no one else is going to stand with you, but I'm going to stand with you. And you guys know exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. How, many, how many promises were broken to you from people in your childhood, either parents or relatives? Yes. I'm still waiting to catch that fish that my uncle said we were going to catch. <laughs> like he literally said, he said, man, you are not leaving here without catching a fish. I still remember those words. Do you, do you know how many men spoke into my life and said, I'll be a father to you? I, dude, they're nowhere to be found. Why? Because words without commitment mean absolutely nothing. People don't need you to say something to not back it up with your, with your physical commitment. Anybody can do that. But when you back up what you say with your actions, that's true encouragement. Because in a world of people that have broken relationships and broken covenants, they have somebody in their life that will stand by them and say, I will not let, I will not let go of you. I will, I'm, I'm with you. You, can, you can't count on everybody else, but you can count on me. Jonathan was committed to the cause. 
Folks, you cannot be an encourager if you're not committed because it's merely words. When you back up your words with actions, you show people that you are committed to them. You have to stand by them through it. Ecclesiastes 4, 9, and 10. Two are better than one because they have good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him. Do you waver when people's lives get hard? Do you distance yourself from them? Or do you stay through the fight? Does your church and your friends know you're committed? See, one, and, and I'm going to go heart for a minute. Can I go there? Is that all right? Like, what, one of the things that flows through my heart, and, and that when people, and a lot of people don't understand this, because there's, there's a lot of pastors that are hirelings, and they're there for a paycheck, or they're just there as, lo, as long as it's good. One of the reasons why I will never leave faith in victory and why I'm here until death is because I never want someone to say to me that I wasn't committed. Ever. I've had so many people leave me in my life. I've had so many people that have let me down. And I will not be to you a discouragement that you can use in the rest of your life and say, well, Pastor Matt left. He just decided because he wanted to live in greener pastures and he wanted to have a higher paycheck and a better weather. Crosses my mind. Because I'm committed. Amen. I'm here, man. It's funny. People always say it. I'm like, well, I've been standing here for 16 years. I had not gone nowhere. My phone number hasn't changed. I still live in the same house. Because I'm committed. From now until the end. And, I, and, and it's interesting. When you, when you start to have those type of commitments, you start to build deep, abiding relationships with people. People that you're willing to die for. People that you're willing to live for. Because you've put in the time to say, you want, I'm committed you, you can question your commitment. You don't ever question mine. I'm here, man. Yeah. Feet first. That's the way I'm getting out of this thing. There's no other way out. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion. But woe to him who is alone with he fall, when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. I love Hebrews 6.10. For God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown towards his name, and that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. God won't forget the, the commitments that you've made towards him. God won't forget the words that you've spoken. And it's not because, and here's the, here's the last part of it, is that being a, a committed, encouraging person has nothing to do with who you are. It has everything to do with who he is. One of, one of, the, one of the best scriptures in the Bible is when, when the Lord says, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. He himself demonstrates commitment to, he doesn't just toss you out because you had a bad week. He didn't, you've said things and done things that by every right, God could reject you. And do you know what he said? He said, you know what? Even when you are faithless, I'm going to be faithful. Even when you, when you are unforgiving, I will be forgiving. When you're unloving, I will be loving. And so what, 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 what else can we do except be that which God has been to us, which is fully committed, fully loving, fully forgiving, fully living for him. David was able to say this in Psalm 89, 34. My covenant I will not break nor alter the word that has gone out of my lips. How is he able to say that? Because he's seen the commitment of other people that were with him in the times of his greatest need. Be an encourager in Jesus' name. Amen? Would you close your eyes? Would you bow your heads? If you've never given your life to Jesus, I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that today. It's really quite easy. Either you're a follower of Jesus or you're not. Either you've given your heart to him or you haven't. And salvation is the easiest thing in the world. God says, would you leave your life of sin and I will forgive you. Just, ask, just come to Christ and say, Christ, will you forgive me of my sins? And God says, yes, I will forgive you. But, but he wants you to live for him. He doesn't want you to live for yourself. If you've never made that decision before, and you'd say, you know what? I, I want to live for Jesus. I don't want to live for myself. I want to be forgiven of my sins. And I'm not talking about a superstition uh, of, of saying you want to do. I'm saying a, a directional life change. You've been walking away towards God, and now you want to walk with God. If you've never made that decision before and you want to do that for the first time, I want you to raise your hand right now and say, I'm ready to give my life to Jesus. Is there anybody that needs to do that for the very first time? Hand held high. Don't let this moment pass. We want to pray with you. And maybe you've been far from God. 
you've known the truth, you've walked in the truth, you knew it as a child, you knew it years ago. I'm not talking about you had a bad week, you had a bad weekend. I'm saying like you were, there was a moment in your life where you're like, man, I'm a, I'm a Christian and I'm walking with God, but now you're sitting here and you're like, God, I've been wanting to come back. I've been wanting to walk with him again and I, I just can't seem to find my way back. And today you want to bring, bring, come back to a relationship with Jesus. You want to rededicate your life and say, I'm ready to serve you, God. If you need to make that commitment today, would you raise your hand and say, I'm ready to come back to Jesus. Hand held high. I see your hand. Is there anybody else? Now, if you'd like to, I'd like to invite you to come up and have somebody pray with you. I know it seems weird to walk up in front of a room, but you're in a room full of Christians. Everybody here loves you. It's all right, come up. Every eye closed, every head bowed. Praise God. Honey, would you pray with me? Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Let your prayer this morning be, God, help me to be an encourager. And I know you're discouraged, man. It happens to the best of us. But you can be an encourager in spite of your discouragement. Father, we pray today, Lord, that we would be encouragers. God, that we would be conduits of your love, your grace, your mercy. Father, we pray that anywhere that we go, that people would know that we are yours and that we would encourage other people. We praise you and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.